let me share my screen here. And yeah, don't be afraid to like stop at any time. Like, yeah. If you have any questions or anything, let me know because mm -hmm. I think this would give us a good opportunity to kind of like discuss some of these topics a little bit further or maybe look into them a little bit more in depth and stuff. So yeah. cool. Can you see my notes? Yeah, I can. All right, great. So really, uh, we were really fortunate enough that actually Jenny Bryan uh, put up a newer version of this chapter, which was really kind of nice. Um, you'll notice that this is, if you've read the first version, this is significantly longer than the first version. And so, oh, there's Rex. Cool. All right, sweet. Hey, Rex, how are you? Um, so we were just talking about that. This is like, this chapter is significantly longer than the first version. And so um, there is some great content in here. And so I really appreciate the update. Uh, Cause if you remember reading the first version, the first version was like a lot of like nuts and bolts stuff. This is like how you do testing. But what was really kind of nice is there's a shift into more of a discussion of why you should be testing. And so I think there was a conversation about that that's in there. And I kind of wanted to expand on that a little bit more because this is kind of an area that I find to be interesting. Um, and I'll kind of dig into that a little bit more. But I there is just no way we're going to get through all of this in one sitting. And so I'm going to try and get up to 12.8 if I can. If not, we'll kind of let that go into over into next week. I haven't put that material together. So if somebody wants to cover that, they're more than welcome to do that. If not, I'm more than happy to keep digging into it um, and covering it. So uh, a couple of things that I do, a couple of learning objectives, and then we bump up the text so people can see. Really, these are kind of the learning objectives for part one. Part two, I'm still determining what, what those are going to be because I still have to kind of work through that. But Really what we're gonna do is we're gonna define what testing is in the context of package development. We're also going to kind of set a case for why testing is beneficial. You know, why, why justify this work? Why add an extra piece to our development? Um, and so I'm really gonna try and make, well, the book really tries to make a case for this. And also I'm gonna bring in some supplementary materials to make you know, more or add some more kind of um, reasons why we should be doing this kind of work. I'm going to try and show we're going to observe the mechanics of the workflow behind test development. And then we're going to overview the organization of tests. So how we actually organize our tests within our package and then dive a little bit into the philosophy of testing, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So uh, just a quick disclaimer about this. It, first thing is, is that we're kind of getting into the realm of software engineering. So we're kind of getting away from data science and we're kind of getting into more of the discussion of software development and so part of software development is that piece of adding tests to your package and i am going to be the first one to tell you as i've mentioned before i am not a formally trained software engineer so um some of these principles uh i don't have a lot of real world real world experience in and so I will definitely get something wrong. Uh, this Most of the people here know that this is just a learning group and that we're learning, but people that are watching this in the future don't, you know, uh, if I say a hot take or something, don't at me on Twitter and, and you know, uh, tell me that I'm wrong because I probably am wrong. And then much of my understanding is kind of shaped on what I've recently read. And so I've only kind of studied this topic, oh, ever since probably like Mastering Shiny, which was about six months ago. So what I currently know is what I currently read. And one thing that you're going to find out digging into this, like kind of this concept of testing, there are many different philosophies. There are many different methods. And so there are many different approaches to it. And there is definitely some heated debates on how you should go about this in your development process. And so I do not prescribe to any kind of camp. And so what I currently know is what I know, but I'm interested to hear like more perspectives on it. So really kind of tonight's roadmap is really what we're going to do is I'm going to give like a very brief definition of what testing is. I really do think that the this chapter that we read um, does a really good job about kind of talking about like unit testing, especially like the nuts and bolts of it and some of the kind of the general concepts that we need to take into consideration when we're developing an R package. But it really, I think it really just needs some more kind of general like scope of like what a test is. And so I'm going to kind of add in some supplemental materials to that at the start. And then we're going to specifically focus on unit testing because that's the type of testing that the book talks about. And then really what the, the chapter is moving us into is talking about 
going from that informal testing workflow into automating our tests. So moving into more of an automated testing workflow. And that's kind of like the goal of where you want to go. So the first thing that I wanted to kind of start off with is kind of like, let's just kind of talk about what is testing. And so I came across these kind of materials. I think they're really good. I was already listening to this book. I was doing the audiobook version of this book called Understanding Software um, by Max Canant Alexander. Really great book. Um, it really kind of talks about some of the basic um, like software engineering skills that you should have and the software development skills. And there's a, a complete chapter that's devoted to what testing is and how to do testing in software. And I think some of those concepts directly translate into our package development. And so even though it says software development or understanding software, it really does directly apply at least some of those principles, especially if you're developing tests for your package. What's nice about this is this book is a compilation of a bunch of blog posts that uh, Max has written that basically these blog posts were adapted for the book. So this information is freely available to you. And so I really found, uh, well, first he, he also has a book called Code Simplicity, which has a chapter on testing. This is freely available as well. I highly suggest kind of looking at this. You can access it, um, free PDF for his book. And then there's also two blog posts that I found very helpful. This uh, blog post about test-driven development and this idea of the cycle of observation. Um, a really good kind of um, overview of it. And then this other one called the philosophy of testing. And I think this does like a really good general view of what testing is before you even dive into like any code or any syntax or anything like that. This just does a very good broad, broad overview of like why we should be te doing testing. What are some of the general conventions of it? So I've linked those in there. And a lot of the things that I'm going to share with you today um, with like what testing is and why it's important is going to come from that while also kind of talking about more of what the book kind of talks about as well. So what is testing? Well, testing is a method to gain knowledge about the behavior of our software, software being our, our package that we're creating via a system of assertion, which we in our, in our package development call expectations, especially if you're using the test that package, observation and experimentation. And really the goal of testing is, is it's a tool to gain knowledge about our system. And, and something that you'll kind of come across when you read some of this more computer science-y kind of stuff is they like to use the word system. And so I kind of try and use, instead of saying system, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in package because that's what we're developing. We're developing a package and that's our system that we're developing. And so, and because of that, that's the goal. We're gonna use testing to help us gain knowledge about what our package is doing. Specifically, we're gonna be trying to generate knowledge about what behaviors our package has. And so you might be saying, okay, well, there's other ways that we could gain knowledge about a specific package, right? It doesn't have to necessarily be testing. Some places where we might gain knowledge about the behavior of a specific package, whether that be ours or whether that be somebody else's package, is we can go look at the source code, right? You can go access the source code and get information about it. You can read the documentation if there's documentation about it. You can, inter you can interface and talk with other developers to figure out how a specific package, a specific function is supposed to work. You can run the functions and experiment them within your package. And then the last thing that we can use to kind of gain this knowledge is we can write tests. But there is one unique thing that separates tests from all of these other forms of information. Testing is unique from these sources because it validates our beliefs of how our software should work. It's unique because it validates how our functions and our, or the behaviors of our functions and our packages are and what we expect them to be. And so although we can get all this information from all of these different sources about our package, what's unique about testing and writing tests is this validation piece, is we make some type of assertion, we observe what's happening with it, we make a decision about it, and then we perform some action in our development workflow because of that test. So what I really kind of found out, and I guess maybe one of the reasons why I really, really like testing is testing is kind of similar to the scientific method, right? Some idea where we observe the universe, we generate some hypothesis about the universe, we go create some experiment to test that hypothesis. We generate some data and then we draw some conclusion from it. 
Well, testing is pretty much exactly the same thing. Instead of studying the universe, what we're studying is we're studying our system, our package. And what's really kind of interesting about this is that, and where this kind of this kind of example breaks down between like, you know, testing is kind of like the scientific method, is that if our test fails, we can either change our system to make it pass the test, or we could change the test. And so that doesn't always work within the scientific method. You can't always just go, you can't change the universe. So you can only test the universe to see what the laws are, but you can kind of see it's this kind of observation um, and which we'll talk about the observation, uh, observation, development and action kind of cycle here. But um, that's kind of what testing basically is. It's just a tool to generate understanding, to generate knowledge and to generate information about our package. So what questions do people have about kind of this general definition of what testing is? I highly, highly suggest, again, kind of looking at these resources here because they do a really good job of providing like a general definition of what testing is in like software development. So another thing that gets talked about is this idea of the cycle of observation and some of this idea of what testing is. And again, this still deviates a little bit from the book, but I think it directly um, goes with it because I think this is something that we can all kind of resonate within our development. And so one thing that this kind of work talks about is this idea of the cycle of observation, where we create some observation of how our system or how our package behaves, how our function behaves. We gather knowledge and we get information from that. We make some decision based on that knowledge, and then we perform some action, whether that be we do further development, we, um, we modify our function in some way, we change the inputs, we modify the arguments, so on and so forth, and we take some type of action. And as we're developing our package, we go through a lot of these ODA cycles, observation, decision, action, observation, decision, action, observation, decision, action. You're doing that over and over and over again. And so where testing comes into this kind of cycle of observation is that tests enhance that observation phase. It makes this whole ODA cycle more efficient for us. So during that observation phase where we're kind of doing that kind of testing and we're looking at what our function is actually doing and what the behavior is, we're trying to get information every time we interact with our, with our objects that are within our, within our package. And part of this is that testing provides for us this ability to speed up what information is, to, is delivered to us as developers. So one thing that we wanna focus on is we wanna focus on having fast tests. So something that we'll talk about in the book is that we really want to, during our development process, get that quick information. Nobody wants to sit there and wait for 10 minutes for their tests to kind of pass through and say, okay, you're good to go, you're not to go. Uh, there's some kind of general rules of thumb in some of those resources that I provide to say this is that um, tests should cause or should not cause the developer to lose focus. I don't know how many of you have ever been developing before and you run a test and it takes, I don't know, so long, right? Or even if you run our command check, you're not going to run our command check every single time to test your tests or if you just make a small change because that's gonna take you out of the flow of your development process. And so when you're developing your tests, you really wanna focus on trying to not get away from that focus. Uh, it really talks about that your test should run within two to 30 seconds. Uh, I question that because where this was cited, there was no like research, it just said research says. So I really don't have a further citation of it, but with that blog post that I read, it's like two to 30 seconds. And then the completeness of information delivered to your developers, an idea of having enough test coverage. So making sure that you do have good code coverage throughout your entire, um, throughout your uh, entire package. And we'll talk a little bit more about code coverage. We'll talk about some of the gotchas with code coverage, but you really wanna focus on the completeness of it because if you're able to have a complete set of tests across your package, then you kind of have a good idea of like where you can generate knowledge or have a better understanding of what's happening inside of your package. And then the last one would be the accuracy of information delivered. So, you know, making sure that you have valid, reliable tests, because if you don't have valid and reliable tests, you really can't trust your observations, right? And so for my scientists that are here, because I know a couple of people are scientists, if you're getting like invalid data back from your experiments, or you're using bad metrics, or you're having, you know, bad methods that you're employing, 
you really can't trust those observations. So it's not helping you through this ODA cycle. It's not making it faster. And then tests give us something to look at, right? So one thing, when we think about it, if we go to this idea of informal testing, which we'll talk about, is, is this idea of like, how do we verify when something's working? How do we actually verify it? When we're actually developing our package, we're developing our functions, what do we do? How do we verify if something's working? What do you do? Well, you have to look at it, right? You have to see it. And so one thing that you have to do is, is that you have to have something to look at. And so if you don't have any information that's getting returned to you on what's happening in the system, is there something that's really happening? Is there something that's wrong? You don't know. And so the only way that we can test it is if we can see it. Now, the thing about it is, is when we start moving from kind of that informal testing to that automated testing, is we're gonna write code so we can get the computer to see when things are wrong and to return us information. So we don't always have to be scanning for things that are going wrong or to always do those informal tests to make sure that things are right. And so we'll kind of get into that more of like getting away from seeing when something's wrong to getting the computer to see when it's wrong so it can send us the information that we need to speed up that ODA cycle. So, um, and then basically our decisions and actions are determined by what we can see. So that goes back to this idea that if we have inaccurate tests, they're not reliable, that's gonna affect our decisions. Because if it's a bad test and it's telling us that it's failing when it's not, or if your package is working and you're getting a failing test, that's bad information, it's affecting your decisions, which in effect is affecting your development cycle. So um, there's different testing philosophies and methods, and um, some of it gets talked about in the reading itself. So some of these philosophies that you might come across are test-driven development, which we're going to talk about here, where you develop what your expectations are, what you think the behaviors of your functions or your package are going to be. And then with those expectations and those tests, you actually write your function to pass those tests. There's other ones called uh, behavior driven development and test and commit and revert. I'm not real familiar with these. Um, I took these from uh, a mastering shiny course that was taught by, or well, uh, a book club that was facilitated by Russ H. And he kind of talks a little bit more about these. But um, behavior driven development is, I think, more based on like, seeing the behaviors of your function and then writing your tests to fall into those behaviors. Now the, the test commit revert, this one was a little bit more, I really didn't have a full understanding of it, but it was like, I think you like, you test your code, then you commit it into version control. And then if you have any issues, you revert back to the point where your tests were passing. Um, I wasn't really aware of this one too much. And then the other one was this idea of user-driven development. This was one that I kind of came across um, in some of my like supplementary research that I was doing. This one was kind of interesting where this person kind of had a hot take with they're like, yeah, I don't do test-driven development. Um, what I do is I do user-driven development. And what that basically is, is that I'm going to keep writing code. And if there's a bug within my code, my users are going to tell me when that code is failing. And then I'm going to use my user feedback to fix it. And, and the one thing, this was completely out of the context of our packages. This was in the context of like website design and um, like e-commerce design, which made sense. He's just like, listen, I'm going to keep developing functionality within this website and not develop tests, mainly because what I'm going to try and do is I want to build enough features to get enough users to make enough money. Then when, if I have enough money, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hire somebody to write the test for me. And then, so I was just like, well, that's an interesting viewpoint, you know, outside of the context of it, but, you know, you could apply it here within package development. If you have a package that gets used quite a bit, you can have your users respond to you to say like, hey, you need to fix this bug. And so you could kind of use that as like user-driven kind of development. So I thought that was kind of an interesting take. Uh, it was definitely a hot take. Uh, there are some people that did not agree with that, but it was interesting to hear. Um, then there's different methods of testing, right? There's end-to-end -end testing, which we're not going to talk about. There's integration testing. 
But the one that we're going to talk mostly about, and which fits really, really well inside of our, it, in the context of our package development, is this idea of unit testing. So a quick warning is it's easy to go down the rabbit hole of this. Uh, there's just a lot of different viewpoints. This is definitely a subject that's covered quite a bit. One thing that I did notice with my kind of tangential research of it is that this is a heated but interesting area of debate. So, um, you know, I don't have enough of, of, enough experience to form my own opinion on what's the best development strategy. Obviously, the book kind of advocates for a test-driven development. But, you know, I also think this partly depends on the context of testing that you're going to be applying, right? So uh, within, um, you know, if you have something that's very critical, um, especially if it's like mission critical that you're developing, then you want to make sure that your tests are passing and that your tests are valid. But if you're kind of developing a package for yourself and it's, you know, it's not necessarily going to be life or death, you may not necessarily have to have a very strong comprehensive testing um, suite. It just depends on the context you're working on. So with kind of these like discussions about this, um, you know, does anybody have any opinions on testing philosophies or uh, any comments or any other viewpoints that anybody wants to add to that? Maybe just a general question because um, this is just my hypothesis from like limited experience within this community, but it seems that like, you know, people in statistical programming might have a different set of practices or even philosophies from people in web dev versus DevOps or something else. So I'm wondering if you, anyone here has noticed those sorts of difference, not just for testing, um, but for, you know, other aspects of programming. Well, I made a, um, I made a test for uh, like a modeling package I was working on. It was, it was sort of like a test for the whole thing. Like, cause I want to fit a model then see that the estimates are like roughly where they should be for some given data. So it's hard to, I guess you can test that, right? Like every function along the way, it's, it's more practical to test the whole thing um, as like a first pass run. And then, I guess it's on me to find out where I broke the system, unless I've got all the unit tests along the way as well. I think you bring up a good point, Rex, like also too, like how rigid, you know, your testing suite is, right? Like, it sounds like you have some, you know, uh, some like leeway in the types of tests that you have that it has to be with your expectations of your, your expectations you're having. It has to be within some type of range, right? Yeah, I sort of did a, um, like, for some data, you, I sort of, like, did a, um, I don't know, fit a model and then got, like, the fitted values and then see whether, like, how correlated they are with the actual values and say, like, I don't know, that correlation is above, like, I don't know, 0.8 or something, then happy days, that was the, that was the test I used. And if it wasn't that, then I know that, like, it was suddenly fitting some monkey model that was doing something haywire. That's, like, a very global test, right? Yeah. Um, and I mean, so yeah, did that answer your question there, Brennan? Sort of. Um, I guess I'm looking to just get like, just from people's personal experience. So I, I think it does for the most part, but like um, compared to other, you know, types of programming, if this, if what we're learning here today is going to generalize pretty much like in terms of testing philosophies and all of that. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think it really, it's really context specific. I mean, like once you kind of, like I said, like the one example that I came across, and again, I'm not like a web development person or something, but you know, you could kind of come across some like conversations on YouTube where people talk about it. And this person was developing a startup for like an e-commerce website and their viewpoint on testing was like, we're not going to do that because that slows our development down. You know, what we're going to do is we're going to try and just generate features. That's what we're trying to do because we have a certain amount of cash and the only cash that we have can be devoted to, you know, this was kind of the economic argument of it was like, we got to develop features. And so testing just slows us down and we have to develop it fast enough. But once we get to a certain point, then we can, if we need to generate a testing suite for it. But I wish Ryan was here because I think he would have another viewpoint of this because he works for um, the rail industry, right? So trains, right? 
And we've talked about this before in our Mastering Shiny is just like for like the engineering systems to run a locomotive engine, those tests, you know, those tests have to be valid. And then the things that you're generating, they have to pass because literally if you don't, you know, no pun intended, your train will go off the rails, right? So it's like, you know, it, he had a very good viewpoint of it. it's like, it just depends on the context that you have. Like if you're working in the lo- mo- locomotive, you know, industry, you got to make sure you have good tests and you got to make sure they pass, right? So um, that's where I kind of came across. But some of these, I think all these kind of philosophies like transcend, but like something that I kind of came across was like, everybody has a different viewpoint. Like some people hate test-driven develop from some people, some people hate test-driven development. Some people, that's what they absolutely use. And so um, I highly encourage you, there's some good conversations that are linked, especially in some of these, like these materials here that kind of talk about those different like viewpoints. So is there a right answer? No, (laughs) it's just, uh, it, it was hard for my like brief overview of it to like really get like a, what's the right way to do this? So and that's where where I felt like I kind of failed when I started looking at testing was this idea of like, what's the right way? There's got to be a right way to do this. Wrong way to look at that. <laughs> but what are the comments? What are the questions that people have? Uh, I guess I had uh, this Brandon's question reminded me of this like something like a distinction i i don't remember where i read this or heard this but distinction between like scientific code and like uh like software that a lot of people use which is that uh, one is like used by many people many times and the scientific most scientific code is run only once ever uh, yeah, anyway, uh, but I I wanted to ask a question too, uh, which is, I was wondering if anybody has like experienced running tests or, or writing tests, not in the context of developing uh, a package. Because I like have a bunch of functions all the time, right? In like small functions here and there that I use uh, uh, repeatedly and I'm, generally doing running like informal tests for them but they're not in a package and is there like a i guess you could just have a test file that you occasionally run instead of doing informal tests or is there like a uh, a formal way to do that hmm. That's a great question. Um, I think from what I've read, I think there kind of gets at that idea of like the the meso, the meso, that kind of testing, you know, it doesn't necessarily get at like, is there like a framework for it? But I think that kind of concept might talk about it because if you only have like one function that you use, you might only be using like an expectation, like you may only be making an assertion of it, right? Or you may just have one test file for that one function, right? You don't necessarily have an entire test suite, which tests the entire you know package because you don't have a package. So that's that that's like the first initial thought that I have. But I don't know. Does anybody else have any other viewpoints? Huh. Well, maybe we could talk more about it. I think that's an interesting point because, you know, a lot of the time we do, a lot of us have functions that we're just using that aren't necessarily part of a formal package. So, but that's a good point. Okay. So let's talk, let's move on to talking a little bit about why we should care about testing. Well, um, going into our reading tonight, Jenny Bryan says this, testing is a vital part of package development. It ensures your code does what you want it to do. And so um, we really need to take a good good idea and figure out what do we want our code to actually do, get that into concrete, uh, get that, make that very concrete, and then making sure that we write tests to ensure that our code is doing exactly what we want it to do. Now, um, going back to some of those materials that I had, 
there is this law of testing from the book Code Simplicity, which talks about this. The degree to which you know how your software behaves is the degree to which you have accurately tested it. And so going back to that idea of like, to the degree of what, how you know that your software actually behaves or how your package behaves goes into how accurately you're testing it. So it's really important to kind of know, you know, how your tests are actually working and that those, and how that's working is going to lead you to understand how your software is actually working. So some other things of why this is important is it's fewer bugs. Um, it's kind of like double bookkeeping, right? We're able to have, you know, a file that has our function and, 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 you know, takes our inputs, processes that data and returns some output. But then also on the other side of that, we have a secondary kind of book that kind of keeps what our expectations are, what we have written down, what our assertions are, what should be the result of that function running in a certain way. The other thing is, is it helps us kind of shift our development mindset, right? It's going away from like that exploratory uses where we're just kind of like throwing things at our function and just kind of verifying like to see if everything works and, it, um, and going into more of like asking questions about, okay, if I have this test written for this specific function, if I make this change or I add this feature to this function, how is that going to affect the behavior of my function to a point where it's going to either pass my tests or it's going to fail my tests? Because your tests are basically saying, this is the, expecta this is the expectation that I have. This is the behavior that I want it to do. And if I make changes to that function to add a feature or to modify it to make it more efficient, whatever you're going to do, refactor it in some way. If it fails that test, then it's going against what your expectation was. And so you have to ask yourself, was it a bad test initially or was it a bad function? The other thing is, is it helps us document and account for edge cases. So generally we have some idea of how a function or when we're developing a function, what we want it to do. But what happens in those cases where a user throws something completely um, left field at it? What if they just throw something crazy at it? And so what happens if you and your development and your testing, you find a lot of those situations where a user might throw something crazy at your function and it doesn't behave like it's supposed to. So what you want to make sure you do is that your function behaves like you want it to do, to do so. And so in your tests, what you're doing is you're documenting what are those edge cases. And so in informal testing, you might just do that automatically where you're just kind of like, okay, I know this edge case, know this edge case. But as your package grows and as your functions grow or as your package grows or adds more features to your package, you're not going to remember all those informal, you're not going to remember all those edge cases that you ran on every single function. And so, you know, it allows us, those tests allow us to kind of document those specific edge cases. And then also it's a less chance of breaking features when creating new ones. So save yourself from you. So sometimes it's like, yeah, this would be a great feature that you could add, but when you make a small change, that might have a ripple effect for how that specific function is going to um, behave. And so it might be going against your expectations of how that function may have, behave. And so it's kind of like a safety net. It allows you to make changes without having the fear of that it's going to affect how you expect it to behave. The other thing is, is thinking about how functions interact with each other. So you may make a change in a function and that function behaves and pass the specific test for that function, but you don't know the downstream effects. It may affect some other function in your package. And you don't know that until you run into that, run that function again, and you realize that's, that it's wrong. And so what you could do is you could automate that process by writing a test so that you can get that information where that kind of downstream effect happened. You also get better code structure. Uh, Well-designed code is easy to test. So if you find it really easy to write tests, it's a good indication to you that you have well-designed code. Um, you can also generate personalized feedback as well. So uh, again, it goes back to that ODA cycle, that observation portion of it. Generate feedback for yourself so that you know what exactly went wrong so that you can quickly iterate and figure out, okay, what decision do I need to make? What action do I need to make to modify my function to meet my expectations? It also forces you to break complicated operations into separate isolated functions. So I thought this was kind of cool because it was this idea of, you know, 
and I find my, I get into this trap sometimes too, where I try and write a function and it tries to do everything. It's going to wrangle, it's going, or it's going to export data. It's going to wrangle the data. It's going to create this cool visualization. We're going to create this cool option where it could output a table as well, but a plot as well. And then you sit there and say, okay, let's write a test for this. You write a test for it and you find out, wow, it's really hard to write a test for this one function. Oh, well, maybe I should go back and I should split it up and be like, okay, let's just do a wrangle function. Let's just do, or let's just do an export function. Let's just do a plot function. And so it really kind of forces you to like break those complicated operations down to make your code simpler. And then easier to test functions are easier to understand because you're breaking it down into the specific component parts and the specific behaviors that you want from it. The other thing is, is this idea of call to action. Um, writing tests force, forces you to make your goal for your function concrete. What do you want it to do? So again, sometimes I myself fall into that trap. I'm sure some people other in this group has fallen into that trap where you want your functions to do everything for you. You wanna provide all these arguments for you so that you can modify all this complicated behavior. And it's really hard to kind of say like, yep, my function does this one specific thing and it does it very, very well. But, you know, when you go and test it, you kind of figure out, oh, okay, maybe there's a better way to do this. Um, you know, this is what I exactly wanted to do. Especially when it gets to test-driven development, um, it really forces us to write out our expectations. This is exactly what I want it to do. And this is my expectation for when the, when the package or the function runs right now, whether it runs in the future, whether something changed, this is how the function will always work. And so we always write those expectations and test driven development first, then we modify our function to meet those behaviors. The other thing to kind of think about this as well is, is like the environmental in, impacts as well. A lot of our packages have a lot of different dependencies. So package dependencies. If a package updates, a package change, is a function change, we have no control of that. And so one thing that's going to be nice about this is, is that with having our expectations written out, if that behavior changes, we can figure out, is it our function or is it based on a dependency of that function? Uh, we could also write our functions to pass tests that we write. Um, it's going to tell us if, you know, uh, it, it could either tell us like, okay, do we need to modify our code to meet our test or did we have a bad test? Um, and so we have the opportunity to modify both. And then the other good thing about this is it provides documentation to users what our expectations are. And so one other perspective that I had about, that I came across about the importance of testing is this idea of it's documentation. Um, and then this developer, when they were talking, was like, I always write a test because this is like, like the purest form of documentation outside of an example, because it tells the user exactly what I expect to be returned from this function. And so um, it really kind of makes you, it kind of serves as documentation as well. Robust code. Um, it helps, you know, build confidence when we add a new feature. So we have confidence that if we do add a new feature, it's going to catch if there's any failures, whether that be inside of the function or any downstream effects, which we talked about before. It saves you, it saves you from yourself, death by simplicity. Sometimes, uh, sometimes when you're developing, you're going to look at a function and, you know, it's really, really complicated. It has a lot of different um, components to it. And you're like, oh, I'm going to really kind of simplify this. And, and there's a simpler way to do this. And there might be the situation where, the complexity is in there for a certain reason, and the tests will catch if you're trying to make something simple when it can't be simple. And so it really kind of helps you save yourself from this idea of making something simple and then having it not work because of all the edge cases that you're trying to account for. And then this wasn't in the book, but uh, this was also from the Mastering Shiny um, book club that Russ H put on this idea of protect your holiday. Um, how many of you work in a team? Rex, do you work in a team? Do you enjoy when you go on your holiday breaks, your vacation? I'm sure you do. So it's good to have tests because if you go on holiday and, you know, there's still feature developments that are going on and somebody wants to add a feature and you don't have tests to catch a bad problem and someone introduces that feature, 
somebody's going to call you on your holiday. You're going to have to fix it. And nobody wants to work on their vacation. So I thought that was kind of interesting because that was Russ, Russ H's um, viewpoint was like, I write tests so that nobody bothers me. Uh, so I thought that was kind of neat as well. So when it kind of comes down to it, you know, we, we already, we already do testing, but we already do testing kind of an informal way. Right. And when we do informal testing, this is kind of the workflow. And I've kind of expanded a little bit more from what the book talked about, you know, kind of from my own experience, but the book kind of summarizes it, but we all go through this kind of informal testing workflow where we write a function, we load it with dev tools, load all, we kind of experiment with it. We kind of change the inputs a little bit, make sure the behavior is correct. Maybe we throw a couple of like curveballs at it, you know, make sure some weird edge cases the function can handle. And then we visually verify, okay, is this thing actually working as intended? Okay, great. Visually works. All right, go write the function, go do that kind of same workflow again. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is, is what happens if you leave this code for three months, right? Are you going to remember every single edge case that you threw at it? Are you going to remember all the different argument combinations that you threw at, or put through your function? It's not possible. You're human. You know, we forget those things. Um, it also makes your makes breaking your code easier as well. So um, I've been in kind of that, that constant, constant feedback loop of like, I make this change in this one function. Oh, shoot, this function's not working. Or, oh, I make this change in this function. Okay, my analysis doesn't match up anymore. What's going wrong with it? So um, just doing this informal testing workflow makes it a lot easier for you to break code. And then the other thing is just efficiency. Uh, I don't know how many times, especially when I first started working with R, was this idea of like constantly changing the same bugs over and over, you know, keep addressing those same bugs, right? And so you're just like, man, I felt like I've, I felt like we've came across this problem before. Why is this a problem? And as I've kind of matured through my development, you know, of R and kind of like R packages and R functions, if I ask myself that question of, I know we came across this problem before. That is a good indication of we need to write a test for this. Because if it's something that's in my mind saying we've come across this problem before, we, if we're fixing this again, then we should have some type of test or automated test to catch this. So what's the real problem? And Jenny Bryant kind of summarizes it like this. The real problem is, is that you don't test your code because we do test our code through this informal matter. It's the problem that we just don't automate our tests. And what's really nice is that, you know, there are, there are packages and functionality built into R and our studio and um, different packages that we could use that allow us functionality to help us automate our tests. And so the book really talks about um, this package called Test That. Uh, specifically, it talks about using the third edition of Test That. Uh, I have not. Uh, dug into this idea of additions yet. The book digs more into it, but it suggests using the third edition. And if you have previous packages to update up to the third edition. Um, you can run this kind of convenience function from use this to set up your testing framework. What's nice about this is it's going to set everything up for you, just like we've talked about in this entire book. Use this has some great convenience functions. Use them. And so basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna create your testing framework by putting your test, test that into um, this directory here. It's gonna modify your description file to add the fields and the specific specifications to add the third edition of test that to it. And then it's going to give you functionality to, um, or it's gonna create this test that.r file that is gonna be run when you run your entire test suite or when you run our command check. Uh, one big thing about the test that file is do not modify this file. Um, so that was kind of pretty explicit. I was going to share exa an example with you, which was kind of interesting because if you go way, way back, this was a great example for why testing is important. So if anybody remembers like our first, maybe our first or second meeting, I remember we kind of did the first chapter, which was like a complete overview of package development. And I kind of talked about testing. Uh, I remember I created this function called uh, create date file name. And I remember I created a test for it. And so I created a test here. And so this is the example here. Here's our regex excite package. 
uh, here's a here's the test folder. So you know, I ran use this um, use test that third edition. It you know created this directory structure for us, created this test that file um, that will run our tests again. Don't modify this by hand. Use the convenience functions to modify that. But I created this test. And what was nice about this is I was like, huh, I wonder if my function still works according to my test. So I decided to run my test to see if this function still works. Uh, whoops, I got to, whoops, doo -doo -doo. library test that. I got to load all, excuse me, do a load all. Run that, test that. Oh, it passed. What the heck? It wasn't passing before. Uh oh. Okay. Well, that is really odd because I swear this was not working. Well, anyways, that's weird. Maybe my work machine, there's something wrong with it. Well, anyways, before it wasn't passing, now it's passing for some reason. So now I need to dig into my function a little bit more. Maybe I changed my function and made it work. But basically you could kind of see what this, what this test is, right? You know, I'm just testing to create this data file name, but it's giving me information about what my expectation is. My expectation is, is that it would create this, um, that this function here, create date file. If I pass a string file name into it, what it would do is it would append the system time onto it and it would do some like kind of string um, manipulation to it. So here's just a little bit of regex to kind of do some um, string manipulation. And then basically it would return, you know, a formatted file name. And so my expectation would be is like, okay, if I do test, if I run, this function here on this string here, it's gonna return that file name and it should match what gets outputted here. Dang, I thought this was gonna be a good example, but for some reason now it's actually working. So I guess it's meeting my expectation. So we're gonna move on. But anyways, uh, going back to my example, you know, here's the test that, here's the test that file, um, here's the test data that I'm using with that specific function that I'm testing. And here's the expectation that I've created for it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more. We'll kind of drill down into that more, but sorry, I'm kind of cruising through this. What, what questions do people have about um, what I've discussed so far? All right, cool. So uh, how do we go about creating a test? Well, we've kind of already talked about this a little bit, um, but again, everything goes in that test, test that folder, especially if you're, if you're using the test that package for testing. Um, I'm not really totally familiar with um, other testing packages, but test that is pretty popular. Um, anytime that you use this test that, your R files need to be appended with this test dash prefix. So if I go back to my example here, when I created my test, you can see it's it's appended with this this test dash and then stir split one. Um, when you create your function using that convenience function use r and use test um, use r. What's nice is it will create that r file, put that r file in there, but it will also give you an informative message in your console to say, "Hey, do you want to create a test? If you do want to create a test, run this function." Great reminder to be just like, just create the file. Even if you don't put anything in there, just run it, run the use test and it will create it. There's some nice conveniences with this as well. If you have a function that's open, oh, that's this one, that's not what I want. What's nice about this is if you have your, uh, uh, let's go to the, let's go to functions here. It is smart enough that if you have a, create date file name. So here's the function definition for that. The active file will open if you just pass is test. So it's smart enough to know what the active file is. So if you just run an empty function, it will automatically open that specific test file for you, which is really nice. If it doesn't exist, it will create it for you. So just a lot of thought went into that. And so Super nice convenience. Uh, let's see here. Oh, man. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the basic form of what it is. You know, we kind of talked a little bit about it. Here's kind of your string value that um, provides that information to you when your tests fail. So when your tests fail, this prompt will be sent to you. So if this test were to fail, which this is just the standard um, test that gets outputted when you create a test file. Um, 
you know, when something fails, you'll get this message here. Again, make that informative. So if it does fail, you know exactly what fails. Um, some three fundamental components. You have the test that function, which is this function that's wrapped here. You have that string that, that describes the test. And then you write a series of expectations that you have, those assertions. I have this, I have this um, here's my function. And then, or here's the test data that I want. And then this is what my expectation is. And if those don't match, then it will fail, which we'll talk a little bit more. So uh, let's talk a little bit about running our tests during development. And I think this is where Aaron was kind of getting, getting at with his conversation about kind of having those errant functions. And so um, I liked how Jenny kind of organized this a little bit into macro, mesro, and micro. So I was like, I'm going to create a diagram to like make this a little bit more informative. And so I don't know if it works. Let me know if this works for you. If it doesn't, um, you know, we can rethink it. But I'm going to call it the inverted pyramid of running tests during development. And so the reason why I call this the inverted pyramid is because it's starting at a very micro level, you know, very small, like the top of a pyramid and it's expanding out. And so, you know, and, and throughout your development cycle, you're gonna be at different levels of this pyramid, right? So when you're doing your micro iteration phase, this is where you're just working on the individual function, right? You're like kind of checking the function, you're loading all, and what you might be doing in this situation, if I go back to my example with the regex excite package, is what I might have is I might have my function open up over here where I'm developing it, right? So I could be developing my function here and I might just be running one line of my expectation. You don't have to run your entire test that, you know, here. You don't have to run your entire test file. You can run just one expectation to make sure it works. Again, remember, go back and going back to that ODA cycle, speed that up. And so, one way to speed that up is you don't have to run every single expectation. So when you're developing your function, maybe you only care about one piece of your functionality. Um, so that's kind of like the, the micro iteration. The meso iteration phase is another step up, maybe looking at an entire set of tests. So when you're doing this, what you might be doing is you might have, and I don't have an example here, but oh, maybe I do in here. Uh, let's see, let's go to the test here. I know I'm running up on time here. So test that, let's go to string split one. So here's a good example. So here you can see that we have multiple tests in here for this string split one function here. Um, there's two expectations here. When we're in kind of that meso level of iteration, we might just run this one set of tests and run those two expectations. We don't have to run this whole file. We don't have to run all of our test files. We don't have to run the entire R command check. Again, speed up that ODA cycle. If you're only caring about one specific functionality, run that meso level of iteration. And then the last one is that kind of macro iteration. This is where you're kind of getting to the end of development. That's when you're gonna run the entire test suite. That's when you're gonna run your R command check. Again, that macro iteration phase, depending on your test suite, especially if you're running our command check, because we all know how long that takes. Um, that's going to take a lot, but it's more comprehensive. It's checking a lot more things. It's running your entire test suite to make sure it's meeting all of your tests and all of your expectations. And so, you know, speed up that ODA cycle, start really small and build out from that during your development, because it will help speed up your development. Um, I brought this up because I thought this was a really interesting point that Jenny brought up because when I was first developing, when I was first developing tests or developing packages, or excuse me, sorry, it's getting late. Uh, <laughs> my brain is getting fried. Um, it, it, when I first kind of started like developing like packages and stuff, my thought was like, okay, I got to run the entire test suite every time. You know, I got to make sure everything's working. And then before, you know, I, I just got bogged down and I was like, you know, this is so slow. I should be just like, you know, I'm getting out of the flow of things. I'm not developing fast enough. This test thing, nah, forget it. But then when Jenny kind of talks about this idea of we'll break it up in the, into these three phases, the micro, the meso, and the macro, it speeds up things. 
because you're looking at those specific things that you want to test in that moment to keep that speed faster. And where you're at in your development phase is going to dictate, okay, which one do you actually do? And so again, really focus on your development, speed up that ODA cycle by kind of thinking about what should I, what tests should I be running in the specific moment of our development cycle? I don't know. Does this help? Does this, does anybody have any questions about this? I find it so easy to just test, test all. And if it's, if it's short for the whole package, and it's so tempting to just do that all the time. But I guess it depends how big the package is and if there's other bugs that are there that are not the one that you're working on, right? Yeah, I mean, I just come back to that idea of like just our command check, right? Just you know, I mean, I'm glad our command check's there. And I, I understand our command check just isn't your test suite. It's, you know, it's everything. It's your CRAN check, but it is a test suite, right? It's testing to make sure it can go on CRAN. It takes so long. It bogs you down. Like it slows you down so much. And yeah, I mean, I like, really, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I really like um, how you can do the little run examples. You can do tests like separately from the check. But you can't like, you can't only, I don't think you can only like build vignettes or only test the namespace. And there are things that like, if you're working on it, it takes a long time to run a check to check those things. And that's really annoying, I find, because like then your test literally is to run a check and that can be like five minutes or whatever, depending on the package, right? Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing too is like taking it out of the context of like our, well, it's weird because like, I don't know if anybody has done like shiny development, but like one part of shiny development is developing your shiny app as a, as a package. And there's a form of testing that you can do where you're testing like user interactions, but that type of testing takes so long to generate information that you need. And so it's like, it just takes forever. Right. And so I don't, know, I don't know if that answers your question, Rex, but like, I, I hear you, right? Like you, who wants to sit there for that, like five minutes to like do your check? I mean, that's just me anyways, but some people they're willing to slog through that. But I was really glad that I saw this because it made a lot more sense. You don't have to run everything. Like you could write like a very, especially when you're developing, especially with that test, you know, that test driven development is you could just write like a specific test for one small piece of functionality. And it goes back to, it keeps going back to that ODA cycle that I presented at the start. Is like it speeds that up. So I don't know. I find this stuff really fascinating, to be honest. Like it's like, because at first when I first started testing, I was like, this just this just takes too much time. This is too slow. I, I want I'll be I, you know I want to write functions. I want to do the fun stuff. But then like when you realize you just like oh there's ways to speed this up. And in fact, if you speed it up, it can make your development even better. You know so. I don't know. Yeah, it would be nice if there was, um, you know, when you do like a build with like uh, with a book down book, you can like pick to build or, or you can just do the Git book or whatever. Um, it would be nice if they had a test thing where you could like select on the drop down, pick the test suite that you want, and then the shortcut just does that, right? Because otherwise you'd have to like type the command to get the specific test script that you have that you want to work on. Oh, that's, that's a neat idea. Well, I think that's kind of where, and, I, and we really didn't talk about it too much, but I think that's where this idea of like splitting your tests up into separate files comes in, right? Because it gives you the option and we didn't really, we haven't talked about this yet because I know we're already kind of at the nine o'clock mark, but kind of this idea of like your test files, which hold your individual tests, which hold your ex expectations, you know, that gives you kind of that option, right? Like, I'm just going to run this one. I, there's got, actually, you know what? I wonder if there's an argument in, what is it? Test active file, would that, and you, if you run the test active file, that would run that specific, I, I'm assuming, I'm not really 100% sure, but, or maybe test file. No, that's depreciated. 
So like, I would guess like test active file would run the specific test that's, or the file that's associated with that specific file. So I think that kind of gets at you, what you're trying to get, like, kind of get at, but I feel you're right. Like if there was some functionality where you could run like a specific suite of tests, right? Yeah, that's probably, <laughs> I just didn't know about it. <laughs> well, I think, well, I mean, it also brings up a good point too. If you know that there are gonna be tests that are really, really slow. Right. And this, and I don't think the book really talks about it too much. I think later on, I think they say they're going to talk about it, but like, if you know, you have tests that are going to take a long time to run, you should be offloading that to like a CI CD pipeline because, and for people that aren't familiar, continue in continuous integration, continuous development, you know, what you can do is in your version control system, especially if you use GitHub or something like that, you can have tests that get run anytime you check code in, or if you run a PR, if you've done, if you've submitted through the book, there's some, if you submitted materials to these notes, it kind of does like a CI. It has some checks for that to make sure that the book builds is kind of the same kind of concept. But if you have long running tests, or if you have certain sections of tests that you only want to run when you check something in, Offload that to your CI CD system is what I'm thinking, but but I I I'm not that's something that I would love to explore further, but I just haven't really dug into. But I think it's really kind of cool. But but I, I you know it kind of keeps coming back to this idea of like you know when I first learned it, it's like man this is such a slog man why is this taking so long. I think, I think that's probably why this part of the book was, well, I, I killed the book, didn't I? Dang it. Um, I think that's probably why, you know, you know, Jenny added that to the book was like, there's probably a lot of people complaining of like, this just takes too long. Why am I doing this? And so people would create packages. I'm just assuming, right? I don't have any facts or, you know, information on this. I bet some people were developing packages with no test suite <laughs> because it's like, ah, oh, this is too slow. And so Jenny's like, all right, well, we're going to address that problem by saying like, you don't have to run everything every time you can speed this up. You just got to learn how to speed it up. So I don't know, Jenny, if you're watching tweet at me and tell me if I'm on the mark or not, I probably not, but you know, that's what I'm thinking it was. Cause my first experience was like too slow. I, I want to move. I want, you know, I want to develop stuff. I don't want to spend my time thinking about tests, but now it's like shoot with the superpower, the mezzo, the minor mezzo, can't remember the, the terms but you you know what i'm yeah. saying yeah I'm, go ahead aaron i was wondering you know how for make files uh they when you run like do make it only runs on the stuff that had changed since the last time make was run i was wondering if something like that is possible for tests where even if you run the whole thing it only tests the things that are relevant to what's changed since the last time tests were run. Hmm. I'm not sure. Does anybody else have any input on it? I've never, I, I, I've heard of make files. I've never used them, to be honest with you. Hmm. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, here's the book. Uh, what other questions do people have? To test expectations. Like I said, this is a this is a pretty this is a pretty meaty chapter. <laughs> it's it's got a lot in it. Um, I actually have a student worker that I I suggested read it, and uh, she was like, "This is a lot." I'm like, "Yeah." but it's, it's good. It's good for you. So, you know, definitely, definitely uh, take it all in because it's going to be, it's, it's definitely good information. So I don't know. Any other questions, comments, um, anything that I got wrong? Anybody want to add to what I've, what I've shared tonight? All right, cool. Well, um, I think, I'm going to try my best to see if I can finish the rest of this chapter next week. I'm going to try. I think we could get through a bunch of it because a lot of it's kind of like the same idea of like how you set up your expectations. 
I think one part that's going to get kind of hard for me to talk a little bit about would be um, like, uh, I think it's like text test fixtures. Cause that was a completely new concept to me. Like I, I haven't been introduced to that. Like I had the basic like testing down, but when it came down to like test fixtures and all that, like that was something that was brand, brand new to me. And then um, this idea of mocking. Yeah. I, that one kind of went over my head as well, but I'll see how far we get with the last one. If at least I think if we can't get through it, then, you know, we'll have just a little bit on the last one or we'll do next week, maybe a little bit the week after that, but we'll for sure within by next week, try and get as far as we can with this chapter. So cool. That's all I have for everybody. So thanks for joining in. Um, we'll talk to y'all later. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Colin. Yeah. See ya.